All right, you guys, how are you all doing today? Good. Well, good, good, good. Well, good to hear. My name is Eli. Today I will be your tour guide. Welcome to the Lost Seat. Now, this tour is going to consist of a three quarters of a mile round hike and a boat ride on a four and a half acre underground lake. It's a half a mile walk down to the lake and then a quarter of a mile walk back out with three rest stops along the way. Now, some rules to go over before we get going. Please stay on the trail and behind the guide at all times. Do not smoke, do not litter, and do not break. Damage to face or touch any of the cave walls or formations. That could net you a Tennessee State fine of up to $50 to $500. That's not up to us. That's up to the state, so please respect our cave today. We have a motto here. Take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but footprints. Now, believe it or not, this yellow tunnel is not the natural entrance to the cave. We blasted this out in 1964 through 135 feet of rock and dirt to make entering the cave way easier. The natural entrance is about a quarter of a mile from here. Now, you don't get to see it, but I do point out its general direction. Now, guys, we're heading into the cave, so be sure to watch your step. It can be very slippery. I recommend you stick to the floor mats where you guys can. If you do start to slip and fall, be sure to yell out and tell me so that I can move out of the way. Follow me, guys. <laughs> now, everybody, be sure to watch your head here. This is the first of many more low-hanging rocks. There you go. All that pretty stuff up there is what we call the Cascades. The amber colored formations on top we call drapery. It's made of iron oxide, which means it's just really pretty rust. Now, we here at the Lost Sea have a different name for it. We like to call it cave bacon because when the light hits it right, it kind of looks like bacon. Right below that is a white waxy substance, which we call flowstone. That is made of calcium carbonate, which is actually the main ingredient in things like Tums and Rolaids. Now guys, you know at Disney World where the floor drops out from under you really quick on that Tower of Terror ride? <laughs> yeah, that's not what this is. This is a dead end. So you guys are going to follow me back across the rickety bridge to the Yellow Tunnel. Then we're going to head deeper in the cave and resume the tour. Just watch your head on the rock. It is still there. Alright you guys, now throughout the rest of the tour, you're going to see a lot of wooden railings along the pathway. And those are simply there to mark the trail. They are not meant to be sat on or leaned on whatsoever because they are not going to support your weight. Now be sure to watch your step on the path. It can be slippery. You can follow me. All right, all that right there is the Veil of Tears. It's an active formation. It drips water, and sometimes it even looks like it's crying. Now the formations on top are stalactites, and the ones on the bottom are stalagmites. One easy way to remember that is that stalactites hang tight to the ceiling, and stalagmites might get tall someday. Now if these remain active and continue to grow, they'll eventually meet in the middle and form a stalactostalagmite, or if that's too much of a mouthful, they're also known as columns or pillars. Now we're making our way down again. Watch your step on the path. It does change from concrete to clay. Now guys, I have good news. We're actually putting in brand new metal handrails that you will be able to lean on. <laughs> Bad news is, they're not done yet. So sadly, you can't lean on them. Now, the room you've all walked around is called the Council Chamber Room, and back in the 1820s, this cave was owned by a Cherokee chieftain named Chief Craighead, who acquired this land either from the Hiawassee or Oak Hill Land Grant. Now, we believe that Chief Craighead and his tribe are the ones who actually discovered the cave, and we also think that they held tribal meetings down here. In fact, in 1927, a group of teenagers were down here exploring when they found a whole bunch of Cherokee artifacts like arrowheads, pottery, jewelry, some of which is actually on display in our lobby. Now, if you look on the ceiling right there, you will see some of the rarest cave formations in the world. Everybody say, ooh. ooh. Those are called anthodites. They get their name from the Greek word, anthos, which means flower, and they're found in only eight caves worldwide. We here at the Lost Sea hold the world's majority, and they're what make us a U.S. natural landmark. Now they seem to form from water evaporation, and they only grow about one cubic centimeter every 1,000 years. Now, those amphites are no longer active. You can tell because of their brown color, but you will get the opportunity to see some active ones across the way. Once we move out from underneath that low ceiling, you guys can look up on your left-hand side above you, and tucked away in this little corner behind a rock, you will see some white and orange amphites, which are still active and growing. Just be sure to watch your head as we pass through. Also, please do your best to keep the line single file so everyone gets a chance to see them. You guys can follow me. Oh, wow. Now y'all, that right there is a leeching bat. Back during the Civil War, this cave was mined by Confederate soldiers for potassium nitrate, which is used to make saltpeter, and that's a key ingredient in gunpowder. Now, potassium nitrate is found in bat guano. The soldiers would come down here, scoop up bags of dirt and bat guano, dump it into bats like these, then pour scalding hot water over the top. That would create a liquid that they called mother's liquor, which would flow into those bowls. They would then add potash lye, boil it, and get the saltpeter crystals that they sent to refineries to make gunpowder. 
Now here in just a second, we're going to be making our way up the path. And on this wall up here to the left, you will see a date, 1863, and a whole bunch of names in thick black writing. Those were written by Confederate soldiers using their burnt out torches. We've had them carbon dated, and they are authentic. This cave used by Confederates is what makes us a U.S. Civil War trail marker. Now do be aware as we go forward, you will also see some white scratches on the wall. That is unfortunately vandalism, so please do best to ignore that and only focus on the vandalism from 1863. Watch your head, follow me this way. Right there is the most clear name we have, P.R. Andy. Now everybody, welcome to the Hanging Rock Chamber. If you all look above you, you will spot some astounding bedrock pendant formations. Now, those formations came to be long ago, a stream rushed in from this room, and the room that you came in from, they then met in the middle and formed a whirlpool. And as the water sloshed around in here, it carved away the rock and dirt, and left us with the hanging bedrock penguins. If you look up on the back flat surface on the ceiling, that is actually the eye of the world below. Now, behind me right here is the big room, which is the second largest room in the cave that we can access. And it's also the site of the natural entrance to the cave, which is 132 steps up at a 45 degree angle. Now, we do not get to go up into that room, as it's used exclusively for our wild tour, which is where you can actually camp out in our cave and explore some of its crawls, which are what those are. Now, I'm going to talk more about that tour later, but I will tell you some history about the big room. In 1940, a 90 foot deep pit was discovered in there, and in it were the remains of an ancient place to see Jaguar. When the cat was alive, they estimate he was 8 feet long and 500 pounds. We sent his bones to a museum of natural history in New York, and they sent us back a bronze casting of his face and paw print, which is also on display in the lobby. In 1947, the big room opened up as a bar called the Cavern Cavern. It had three moonshine stills, three dance floors, and a live band on the weekend, but it was never much of a success. You see, due to pressure, temperature, and humidity, it is very hard to get drunk in this cave. Your metabolism actually slows down down here, and you don't process the alcohol as fast, and that means you can drink, 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 and never feel a drop. At least not until you go to leave. People came down here and thought they were getting scammed with cheap moonshine, and then went storming out the natural entrance. And the higher they got, the higher they got. Eventually, the alcohol <laughs> system caught up with them, they passed out, and then came tumbling right back down the stairs. Due to minor injuries and a lack of business, the cavern cavern was only open for about two months. Finally, in the 1950s, our big room opened as a fallout shelter, and it housed enough supplies to feed 20,000 people for up to two weeks. Now, thankfully, no disaster ever happened, and no supplies were ever needed, so most were simply disposed of, but some do remain right down there. Those are containers, salty crackers, and barrels of water. Now, you guys, the last thing I will be showing you in this room is total natural darkness, but I do need everyone's help. If you guys have anything that lights up at all, be it a phone, camera, smart watch, flashlight, please just do that to cover it over, turn it off, and just put it in your pocket. That way we can get the full total natural darkness experience. Once again, guys, if you have anything that lights up, please do best to cover it up. Alright, everybody, the room we're walking back through is the third largest in the cave that we can access. It is 600 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 35 feet tall. Now, we call it the Keel Room. It gets its name from the Tennessee Red Keel Clay that's found throughout its center. Back during the early days of the region, settlers would come down here, collect the clay, and mix it with buttermilk to create buttermilk paint that they would then use on their barns. Now, be sure to watch your head and your step. You guys can follow. This way. If you guys in front you have questions, feel free to ask. I don't have anything to talk about on this part of the door. No. Alright, you guys, you might be wondering about that creepy red hole right there. That's what we call the Devil's Hole, and it's a water erosion tunnel. It goes down about 13 feet, tapers to a hole about the size of a softball, and we honestly have no idea where it even goes from there. Now, there is no legend about it. They say if you look down in it and you have been good, you will see nothing. It's just a hole. But if you look down in it and you have been bad, you will see the face of the devil himself. Is it true? Feel free to step up and find out. Hesitation means guilt. This is cool. 
All right, guys, looks like you've all had a good look at the Devil's Hole, so you can also have a peek over this way. This is what we like to call our Baby Grand Canyon. Now, we call it that because it kind of looks like the real Grand Canyon, but mostly just because it was formed in the same way. Long ago, a stream rushed down through here, it carved away the rock and dirt, and left us with a nice little model Grand Canyon. Here in just a moment, we're going to walk through it, and when we do, please don't touch the wall, as that could severely damage it, but feel free to get a good picture. If you get the right angle, maybe you can convince somebody you went and saw the real Grand Canyon at night. Be sure to watch your step on the way down though, it can be very steep. Alright you guys, down this way we're walking through the baby Grand Canyon in all of its glory. Once again, just don't touch the wall. Now everyone, welcome to the spring room. I'm sure you can all hear the water rushing down the way. It's Crystal Falls. It is one of the only visible water sources to the lake, and it's fed by a small underground spring. We used to call it Emerald Falls until the green light bulb burnt out, so now it's Crystal Falls. Also on the way down is an authentic Tennessee moonshine still taken from the cavern tavern itself. I'm sorry, no free samples. But before we make our way down, I have a major warning. This is a very difficult walk. It is a long way down, and then a long way back up. It is very steep and very slick. Now it is not mandatory that you go down, but it is mandatory that you come back up. If you do not feel like you can make it, we have benches and you can wait here alone in the dark for 20 minutes and we'll come back and get you. But waiting here will cause you to miss the lake and the boat ride. So would anyone like to stay here? Just me then. All right, guys, we're going to make our way down. Be sure to watch your step on the path. It can be very slippery. Welcome to the Ben Sands Tunnel. Now I got good news. You can touch the walls in here. We blasted this tunnel out so you can't hurt it any more than we have. The wall to the right is all the rubble from the excavation. And if you look on the ceiling, you'll probably notice a few blast and drill marks. Now it gets its name, the Ben Sands Tunnel, after the person who discovered the lake. Way back in 1905, during a very severe drought, a 13-year-old boy named Ben Sands was down here exploring when he found and then climbed through a 40 foot long tunnel about the size of a bicycle tire and ended up knee deep in water. Now his only light source was a gas lantern so the kid had no idea what he got himself into. He started rolling up balls of clay and throwing it around the room. He wanted to hit a wall, find out how big the room was, but he never did. All he heard was water splashing so he climbed out of the cave, started running around his hometown and telling people about the underground lake he found. A few months later he had finally convinced his father to come down here and check with him. But by that point, the drought had ended, and the tunnel that he had climbed through had filled back up with water. After that, for 60 years, no one was really able to confirm Ben Sands' story until the Lost Sea opened in the 1960s. They wanted to know if the legend was true, so they came down here looking. Eventually, during another drought, they rediscovered the tunnel that he had climbed through. And then, they blew it up. Once again, feel free to touch the tunnel. Once we blasted through, lo and behold, there the lake was on the other side. Ben Sands was right, and we gave him full credit to the lake's discovery at the age of 73, and one of the biggest I told you so's in Tennessee history. Now y'all, let's go see what he found. Alright everybody, welcome to the lake room. Now you guys are more than welcome to walk across this pier with the max all the way down to the yellow caution tape. Just please do not step on this ramp or boat dock quite yet, as we do have some rules we must talk about first. Alright you guys, before we take the boat ride, we do have some rules to talk about, like I mentioned. First thing, this is a floating boat dock. Once you step on it, it will move a bit. Don't let that freak you out. Also, when you step in the boat, a gap could form in between the boat and the boat dock. In between the lake. The lake's pretty cold, so please step in the boat and not in the gap. <laughs> Once you're in the boat, don't stand up, don't rock the boat, because that will increase your chances of falling in. If you do manage to fall in somehow, try and take your seat cushion with you, as it doubles as your flotation device. Now, if you can't take it with you, we promise to throw you one. They come in red or blue. Just yell out your favorite color. Now, speaking of things falling in, don't dangle anything over the side that you are not prepared to lose, because if you drop something in, I cannot go in after it. Neither can Angela, neither can you. The best we can do for you is shine our lights on it together and watch it sink to the bottom. That's pretty sad, so don't feed the fish your smartphone. Now, you might have noticed, but there are fish in the water. They are rainbow trout, and they are not natural to this lake. They are stocked fish. Now, we're going to talk more about them a little bit later, but for now, all you need to know is that these fish have teeth, and these fish will bite you. We have tour guides with scars to prove it. So for your own safety, please do not touch the water at any point in time. Lastly, we are a large enough group that we're gonna have to take out two separate boat rides. So half you guys get to go with Angela right here and the other half are unfortunately stuck with me. 
Now guys, congratulations, you're sailing the Lost Sea, which is North America's largest underground lake. This is also the biggest room that we can access. It measures at 800 feet long, 220 feet wide, and 65 feet tall at its highest point. The water right here at the top is 10 to 15 feet deep. In the center, it's 30 to 40 feet deep, and at the back at its deepest, it is 65 to 70 feet deep. Our lake is four and a half acres in total. Now the water itself is 98% pure and 2% mineral. Those minerals being calcium and magnesium, and it's 56 degrees all year round. The water has a bluish green color, which is caused by the limestone dissolving off the walls, and it's incredibly clear. You can see 10 to 20 feet down at any given point. We are the 18th clearest body of water in the entire world. Now you might be wondering about the world famous rainbow traps, so the fish are not natural to the lake. I am sorry to break your heart on that. We stocked them down here originally in 1967 as a science experiment in the hopes that they would leave. We wanted the fish to make their way out of here to the surface, that way we could figure out where the lake led or if it led anywhere. So we just took a bunch of rainbow trout, we tagged them, we threw them down here, and then we just kind of hoped for the best, and the best never came. The experiment did fail for two main reasons. The first being total natural darkness. If the fish left the chamber into a separate one without any lights in it, then they wouldn't be able to see. Can't exactly expect them to swim where they can't see. I don't know what we were thinking on that one. Now, the last reason would be fish food. We feed them like crazy. They eat every single boat ride every single day. They get big, they get happy. They don't really want to leave it all, and I can't blame them. We grew attached. We liked having the fish down here, and people liked seeing them just as much. So we decided to keep restocking. Now, we do have to continuously restock the fish. Rainbow trout are a river fish, which means they need a strong current and a rocky bottom to successfully reproduce and lay their eggs. They get neither of those things in this environment, so the fish cannot reproduce in the lake. Is the water drinkable? It is indeed drinkable. It's 98% pure and 2% mineral. Those minerals, calcium and magnesium, are perfectly healthy for you. Now, that's in its natural state. However, with the fish in here constantly producing waste, I really wouldn't recommend drinking the water now. But without the fish in here uh, putting in their waste, you know what I mean, you definitely could drink the water. How old is the water? How old is the water? Cold, we have cold okay. Uh, yeah, it's 56 degrees, all year round, top to bottom. Now, in 1973, we had our first ever divers expedition. Their goal was pretty simple, just map out and explore the lake room, but they ended up coming across something pretty incredible. About 30 feet underneath the water, somewhere along that wall, the divers came across an 800 foot long tunnel. They swam through it and then ended up in a fully submerged chamber that they estimate contained over nine acres of water. Now our lake is four and a half acres, meaning that other chamber is twice the size of the lake room. They swam around a bit and used their sonar to map out a few of its walls, but then there were big problems. Their presence in the other chamber caused its pressure to shift. That led to rocks and sediment falling from the ceiling and the consistency of the water to become like chocolate and milk. Eventually, the situation in the other chamber became incredibly dangerous. At one point, one of the divers was nearly pinned by the rock fall the size of a small car, and the water had become so murky, they could barely tell it to come down. They knew they had to leave, so they did, and they made it out fine, but they were not able to completely map the other chamber. If they could have mapped it completely, then we could have actually claimed it as part of the lake, and it would have made the Lost Sea over 13 acres in total. But due to some very serious safety concerns, we can't fully map it out, and therefore we can't claim it at all. In 2003, we had our second and last divers expedition. It was not to map the other chamber. National Geographic came down here looking for artifacts. They wanted to see if they could find any evidence of Native Americans, or maybe even an ancient fossil. And the most ancient thing they found was a pager. So it didn't really work out. Look at the fish are coming up. Now guys, we are making our way into the fish feeding area. You might be able to tell. And we're gonna do some circles here. I'm gonna show you guys how we feed the fish as well as tell you a bit more about them. Now I will remind you, please keep your hands inside the boat and out of the water. These are rainbow trout, but they act more like piranhas. More like what? Piranhas. <laughs> They're a little mean. Now we have got about 150 to 200 of these guys down here. They eat pretty good. We feed them high protein beef and liver pellets, which is pretty much just dog food for fish. We call it Farina Trap Chow, and they are currently on a diet of four buckets every day. 
Now, since they eat so good, they end up getting really big. Our biggest fish of all time would have been Trevor, who was 16 pounds and seven ounces, and only about three inches short of being three feet long. So you guys probably saw Trevor on display in the lobby when you purchased your tickets. Also, fun fact, Trevor was a girl. Now, there are two very common myths about fish. It's been said before that they're blind and that they are albino, and they are neither of those things. Now, the fish have lost about 20% of their eyesight, but they're not blind. They can still see better than most people. They've also lost about 70% of their coloration, but they're not albino at all. They're just much more green. Yeah, well, they still have a lot of them, but fish out of the air, you Yep. So way in the back there where those lights are, that's the deepest point of the lake and also the end of the lake. Back there it is 65 to 70 feet deep. We do not get to go all the way back in that direction. The ceiling's too low and we all slam our heads on the rock and get the boat stuck. So we're going to do uh, about one or two more circles here at the fish feeding area. Feel free to get a good look at the fish, take a picture or two. And if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Now, if a fish jumps in the boat, you can't actually keep it back in the day. That did happen. A fish jumped in the boat, and an elderly woman beat it to death with her purse, and then she came home. She came back the next day to complain. It tasted like dog food. What happens in the case of a power outage? I'm assuming you have several, <laughs> like several backup generators. You would assume like wrong. When the power goes out, it's dark, and that's just about it. Uh, we have a really complex plan in case it happens. We sit still and wait for somebody to come and get us. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's all we can do. If we're on the lake, we will do circles until somebody comes out here with another flashlight and guides us back into the dark. If we're in the cave, we just stand still and wait. Eventually, another tour guide will make his way down, stand at the back of the group. I'll stand at the front. We'll walk out. You guys will either offer be offered a full refund or the chance to wait for the power to come back on and resume your tour. Does that happen? All the time. <laughs> Every day. Every day. I'm waiting for it. It's not too common. Usually it only happens in the summer during our rainy seasons. Uh, every once or twice, every year I would say. Now it's usually not too bad. Everybody has a flashlight on their phone. Yeah, that's right. yeah. get it out of here. If you have a tour of Mennonite, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> now, right over here is the site of our most recent rock fall. Don't let most recent freak you out because this happened 2,000 years ago. We know because of some of that right there. That's drapery. Some of that cave bacon I showed you at the start of the tour. It does not grow in between rocks, it only grows on the clean slates. So we had it isotope dated, it's about 2,000 years old, and that's how we estimate this rock fall's age. Now you may also hear or feel water dripping, and that's Bessie the milking cow, who is our most active stalactite. She drips a very impressive 39 wow. times a minute. Now if you do get dripped on by Bessie or any of her stalactite sisters, we call that a cave's kiss, and it will bring you good luck. Now if you guys don't get dripped on, I don't want you to feel sad or left out. We are underneath the men's restroom anyway, so it's not too much of a loss. <laughs> You said this is the second largest underground lake. Which is the first one? First place would be in southern Africa. It's a sulfuric lake called the Dragon Bread. So you definitely can't take a boat ride on it. Which makes us the largest commercial underground lake in the world. Being the biggest one you can actually get to see. Now up on the ceiling, you guys will actually see a whole bunch of soda straw stalactites, which are hollow in zip. And if you broke one off, you could use it for a straw. I don't exactly recommend it, as it would make your drink taste like rough and cost you about $500. Not worth it. Now guys, slowly but surely, we are riding back towards the boat dock, and upon reaching it, we're footed up taking the park in an old lossy tradition called bumper boats, which is where we slam into the other boat in the dock. Now don't let it scare you because it happens all the time. Just keep your arms, legs, hands, feet inside the boat and remain seated until I instruct you it's safe to get off. With that being said, if you guys have any final questions, feel free to ask or we can just ride back in awkward silence. Not recently, no. Uh, we do have some cave formations fall off, sort of break off, especially those soda straw stalactites. Those are actually prone to breaking off. If they do, we pick them up and put them in our display case up top in the lobby. Now guys, the last thing I do want to talk about, it may surprise you to know that the water level in the lake is not constant. It can rise and it can fall. Now we are allowed to pump water out to keep the lake from flooding, and we do so on a regular basis. This is not the lake's natural levels. Naturally, it would be much, much higher, but we have to continuously pump the water out to keep it from getting too high. 
However, the water can also drop to the drought, and when it does that, there is nothing we can do about it. We are not allowed to put water into the lake. If we did so, we would lose our status as a natural landmark and become a swimming pool, and no one wants to see the lost swimming pool. So if there's a drought, we gotta wait it out. For example, you might notice that old staircase. That's from the drought of 2007, when we lost over 30 feet of water in just a few months. For reference, the boat ride started at Bessie the Milking Cow all the way back there. It lasted 35 seconds, a minute if you were pretty lucky. People weren't exactly happy with us, they called us the lost puppy. The drought lasted for a little over a year and ended in the spring of 2008. How did they get the boats down here? I've heard two answers. Either we hired Chuck Norris and used a lot of Vaseline, or we brought them down here in three separate pieces and welded them together. But I like the first answer a lot. Yeah, it makes a better story. Definitely. <laughs> All right, sailors, if you enjoyed the boat ride, you can make your way up and off. If you didn't like it, you can walk the plank. Please wait for me on that play beach with the rescue group. I'll join you in a moment. We'll start hike out. Just don't leave without me. It would break my heart. All right, you guys, yeah. it is not the most breathtaking part of the entire tour. I hope you guys are ready. You can follow me. All right, you guys, welcome to your first rest stop. Like I said, you can have a seat, take a breather. In the meantime, I am going to take a quick moment to talk more about our wild tour. So the wild tour is where you can, of course, camp out in the cave. You spend the night in the big room that I pointed at earlier. Now, it's not mandatory for you to stay the night. You can just take a daytime wild tour, and you don't have to worry about the camping thing. But either way, you're going to be entering the cave through its natural entrance, and you're also going to be given the opportunity to do some wild tour crawls where you go through tight spaces, crevices, and tunnels that all have really encouraging names, like Meat Grinder, Misery, and Cruncher. In case you're wondering what a wild tour crawl could look like, that's a pretty good example. <laughs> now that is a wild tour crawl that just looks a lot like some of the ones that we do. Now, you need a minimum of 12 people to participate. You must book the tour about two weeks ahead of time and bring your own equipment, like sleeping bags and flashlights. For any other information, you can certainly check out our website, but I am a wild tour guide, so I could answer any questions if you might have them. So, you guys want to know anything about the wild tour? You have to bring food down too? You have to eat before you come into the cave. Okay. Can't bring food in. Now, a small snack like your granola bar really isn't going to be a problem, and we would definitely recommend you bring a water bottle of some sort, but you're not going to be able to take a crock pot down here. <laughs> <laughs> there, you have to be at least six years old. Other than that, go on ahead. What age? Uh, to any age. If you say you can do it, we're not going to stop you. You sign a waiver. Do you explore under supervision or? Yes, you'll have a guide with you uh, okay. to lead you through the crawls. That's what I do myself. Yeah. I guide groups through the crawls and the tunnels. Now, once the crawling tour is done and it's time for you to go to bed and camp out for the night, the guide will leave. He will hike out, and then the next morning you will hike out on your own. Okay. Yep. Cool. There's no other like animals. The fish. Small thing. critters, mostly salamanders and cave crickets are found down here. The salamanders are just about only up by the natural entrance and the cave crickets are found all throughout the cave. There's a very small bat population left, very, very small, I would say five or six at most, up by the natural entrance where there's not a lot of people. Every now and again when you go on a wild tour you might actually be able to catch a few sleeping on the walls up there. But for the most part the cave really doesn't have that many critters in it. Do they not come down here because their natural instincts tell them that there's just nothing down here for them? Or like why do like raccoons and possums not meander their way in? Mainly no reason to. There's yep. not really a food source down here for them. It's very cool. If you stay still in the cave for too long, it starts to get really, really cold in here. Really, there's just no motivation for mm -hmm. a critter to come down here and den up. Also, the constant human activity definitely doesn't help. Yep. All the people coming through here all the time, most animals are going to want to stay away. Don't tell the raccoons about the fish. Exactly, don't. They'll be down there <laughs> snatching them. All right, you guys, we're going to head up to our second rest stop. You can follow me up. All right, you guys. Further up the path, on the right-hand side, you'll spot an old dirt staircase, which was from 1927, when this cave opened up to the public as Craighead Caverns. You can pay a whole five cents to come down here and explore. There was no tour guide. There wasn't even really a set path. You went anywhere and then did anything you wanted. The main attraction back then was just running electricity. We were one of the first in the area to have such. Because of a very big problem called the Great Depression, Craighead Caverns didn't last, and it shut down in 1931. But Craighead Caverns is still 
still the official name of the cave system. Also, once we reach the third rest stop, you will see a big brown rock right in the center of the pathway. That's the bear's paw. Feel free to give him a high five for some good luck. Be sure to watch your head. You can follow me up. All right, you guys, welcome to your third, as well as your final rest stop. Just some last things that we are going to cover here. Number one, I'm sure you guys saw the bear's paw, who is an inactive stalagmite. stalagmite. Now, he's inactive because people have touched him, so nowadays we just kind of touch him some more. Rumor around here is, if you touch him, you get a week's worth of good luck. If you hug him, you get a month's worth, and if you kiss him, you get whatever the last group had. Also, if you check out the ceiling, you'll see Nemo, the only albino fish in the entire cave. He's just adorable. He is a little baby cave formation. Now, at the moment, he's nothing more than a calcium deposit, so it's kind of hard to figure out what he's going to grow up to be. If he does keep growing, though, he'll either end up looking like his stalactite sisters up top there, or his amphitite brothers over here. Come back in a couple thousand years to find out. Now guys, do any of you have any final questions about the cave? All right then, y'all. That would end so, the... Uh, yeah, when, go when was the cave discovered? It was discovered in the 1820s by the Cherokee Native Americans. As far as we are aware, there is no known date of any prior discovery. Okay. Any other questions, y'all? All right, then. That is in the informational section of the tour. I want to thank you guys for coming out. You've been a great group. I've enjoyed having you. Now be sure to check out our general store and glass blower. And if you did like the tour, leave us a good review online because it always helps us out. Don't forget that my name was Eli, and if you didn't like the tour, I don't work here, and I've never met y'all. You guys can follow me for y'all. We'll make our exit. Yep, you guys can go on out. Thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all enjoy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. That is very much appreciated. Great have a wonderful day. Great tour. I need a Feel free. You can have a left in the yellow color. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you. No problem, y'all. Have a great All right, guys. So that was the Lost Sea Adventure here in Sweetwater, Tennessee. This is John and Kristen with the Pro Cut. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you on the next one.